Good afternoon. Good As you know, I am Brother Chris, and I am serving one of the elder of this church, the Great Commission Global Ministry. And we will continue our study in, in the book of Mark. Uh, we are now in chapter 14, and we will look on verses uh, 43 to 52. And may I, may I request everyone to stand up once more in reverence for the reading of this day? <clears throat> Please open up your Bible with me in Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 52. <clears throat> okay, let us wait. 43. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with, and with him a crowd with sword and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled, and they all left him and fled. Verse 51, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace for bringing us together to study your word. Uh, please ask, give us understanding, convict us of our sins, and give us encouragement as we look onto the pages of your scripture. Let your name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, may all be seated. And as you settle down, I want you to look, uh, to look around. And only by looking, uh, des describe the person around you. <laughs> so we might we might perceive one's character by his or her looks, or maybe we might judge them by, by their appearance. But one thing is certain: um, each of us are uniquely different. Uh, every person, culture, country, and race. Yet, uh, no matter who we are, we are all under the authority of the same God. We all live under the sovereign hand. He is in charge, and he will accomplish. His will in our life. As uh, Psalms 115 uh, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. So that's the sovereignty of God. And, and nothing could make that clearer than our passage uh, from the Gospel of Mark today. As, as a church, uh, we've been working our, our way through the, through the book of Mark for more than a year now. And we are now close to the end. In Mark chapter 14, uh, it was a Thursday night, and, and the Lord is about to be arrested. And the Lord is in the garden of Gethsemane with the eleven disciples. And the twelve, the, the betrayer, are, are now arrives with a huge crowd made up of different groups. So now as they arrest Christ, uh, we will need, uh, witness unique uh, reaction, different comment, distinctive behavior by each person. And in the midst of all that individuality, we will see God accomplish His sovereign will. And as we study these verses, uh, we will see these five unique persons and one group, uh, six in total, all under sovereign plan of God in the redemption of man. So even with the sin of the trial, God is in complete, certain, and absolute control. So and, and that is uh, our title. For the preaching of today, it's the uh, sovereign the trial. So, as we look on each person, we can relate ourselves to at least one of them. Um, we can learn from, from each of them, and how can we honor Christ from, from this passage of Scripture? So, Jesus went uh, from the upper room to the Mount of Olives, so into the Garden of Gethsemane, where there are olive trees, uh, olive press, and a garden, and possibly a place. Uh, 
you sleep uh, seven hours. So three, di three disciples are, are closed by the Christ. So eight are by the gates, and and the Lord has been agonizing in prayer. While he is lovingly warned Peter, James, and John to, to watch and pray in order to prepare for the coming uh, temptation, which uh, we know they failed. So after prayer, the Lord is now ready to face the cross. The last temptation of Christ is over. So he is determined to accomplish his father's will. To bear our sins on the cross. So now verse, uh, verse 42, Christ tells us his men, it's time to go. Christ knows what, what is coming and he stands up, he stands up uh, bloody sweat pouring down his uh, exhausted face. His cloth is staying red. Uh, but he is unwavering and give his triumphant order, it is enough, get up. So let us be going. So but but Christ didn't uh, meant to sneak out sneak out of the back or, mm -hmm. or run away. He meant let's head directly towards this uh, murderous crowd uh, led by Judas. So the soldiers were fully armed, each uh, carrying a, sh a short sword. With them came Jewish temple, uh, temple guards with their weapons. Jews and Gentiles were united uh, once in a common cause. So it must have been a chilling sight uh, from Gethsemane as the mob uh, exit, exited Jerusalem. And its flickering torches moved down to the Kidron and up to the slopes of Olivet. So the plan was perfect. There would be no riot on this night. And if there was uh, any resistance, they were more than ready. So it appears uh, as Jesus saw the map approaching, uh, approaching its uh, Gethsemane, so he led Peter, James, and John to the place where the remaining disciples were sleeping, so near the garden entrance. So he, he rose them and then protectively stepped out in front to meet the soldiers. So John chapter 18 verse 4 uh, records what happened. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And then, uh, this brings us to our verses in 43 to 52. And our first person is uh, Judas. So in verse 43, uh, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up. So Mark is telling us Judas was privileged, prophesied, and premeditated. In verse 42, as Jesus announces uh, Judas, Judas the betrayer is at hand, and verse 43 says, immediately, in, in mid-sentence, while, while, while speaking, the, the betrayal event occurs. So the Lord told us in verse 41, the hour has come. So verse 43, the one who betrays me is at hand. And now verse 43, Judas came. So he came up. And, and Mark remind us uh, who Judas truly is. So he was one of the privileged. In verse 43, it says uh, Judas, one of the twelve. So the phrase, uh, one of the twelve, is used uh, nine times in the Gospel. And eight of them is indirect reference to Judas, emphasizing the treacherous, double-crossing, two-faced, and deceitful nature of his betrayal. So Judas was one of the twelve, the man with the greatest privilege. Believing God in the flesh for years, he heard his teaching firsthand. He witnessed raised, uh, wait, wait, witnessed him raised from the dead, give sight to the blind, heal all diseases, deliver people from, from demons, create food, control storms. And more than that, he saw Christ in private. He knew Christ was sinless, lived in perfect integrity, and spoke in deep truth when no one is, uh, was watching, so, and was always completely wise. So Judas, one of the twelve, one who knew Christ best, now comes up to Christ to betray him. We recall how, how this all came, uh, came about. So the Jewish leaders are jealous, uh, jealous of Christ's power, popularity, and his message of salvation by grace and, and not works. So in their proud uh, self-righteousness, they hate Christ and want to kill him in the worst way. And this week has merely intensified their passion to murder Christ all the more. On Monday, <coughs> Jesus arrived uh, to thousands of people hailing him as, as the Messiah. 
on Tuesday, uh, Jesus crosses the Jewish mafia, headed up, uh, headed uh, up by the high priests, who were making a fortune ripping worshiper of in the temple. Jesus forces all those money changers and animal seller sellers out, intensifying their commitment to kill him. And on Wednesday, with incredible uh, courage, <clears throat> Jesus returns to the temple, uh, still scattered with debris from the day uh, before, and handles every doctrine of trick the religious control of him. So Christ makes every single different uh, religious sub subgroup from the uh, Sanhedrin look to totally foolish, as he clearly teaches God's word. So the Sanhedrin want him dead now. But they are afraid of the people who are owed, owed by Christ and see him as a prophet. So the crowds um, have made it clear that they are upset at Herod and their uh, religious leaders who allowed John the Baptist to be killed. So how will they arrest Christ and, and they kill him? So they need to grab him in secret at night away from the crowds. So, but, but they don't know how. Uh, they, they need someone to know where Christ uh, will be at night so they can arrest him uh, secretly. So then Judas shows up. So Judas initiated it. Uh, and the leaders were glad they offered uh, to pay Judas 30 pieces of uh, silver, which is the price of the slave, in order to lead the religious, uh, the religious to a place and time when Christ could be arrested in secret. Uh, in secret. And unwittingly, they fulfill another uh, prophecy in the Old Testament. So predicting the, their betrayal and, the, and their sack amount in Zechariah chapter 11. So this entire event was all prophesied in the Old Testament as God's plan. And because it's God's sovereign plan for Christ to be crucified on Friday and to die at the, at the exact moment when all the thousands of Passover lambs are being slaughtered at 3 p.m., so Jesus releases Judas when at the upper room to complete Christ's betrayal according to God's exact timetable. So Judas might uh, lead this uh, huge crowd to the upper room location first, but the scriptures uh, tell us Judas also knew about this uh, garden of Gethsemane. So now Judas leads them there. And as we keep on reading these verses, we will uh, begin to see the wickedness of Judas uh, the royal. Judas is, is not only shifty, underhanded, treacherous, uh, and dangerous, but he intentionally wicked. This this is a premeditated murder, and this betrayal will be marked by a clear signal. Look at verse uh, 44 to 45. It says, uh, Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal, saying, Whomever it is, he is the one. Seize him and lead him, uh, lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. So, why does uh, Judas need needs a signal? So, I thought everyone uh, knew Christ. Uh, remember, yeah, it was dark and it is in the middle of the night. And there is no electricity, there is no light bulb by, by that time. And there's only one, uh, there's only torch light. Add to that the reality that they have tried to, to take Christ before, and every single time he sovereignly slip away. And realize also there are over a million uh, pilgrims camping all over around the area. So they need a way to clearly identify Christ. So they need a signal. So the betrayal will, will be marked by, by a kiss. So, which is a normal expression and uh, greetings to in their in their culture. So, it could have been uh, delivered in different ways. Uh, slave kisses feet, uh, inferior kiss hands, and equals kiss cheeks. And this is Judas seeing himself as an equal, betraying his rabbi with an intimate act of affection, honor, love, and respect, which make this action the kiss all the uglier. We have all been betrayed. Uh, we all know what betrayal is, is look like. But a kiss is the blackest kind of hypocrisy. So, can you believe this? Uh, think about what Jesus experienced. The man of sorrows had, had the spiritual leaders of the chosen nation, nation wants to murder him. 
the crowd who made up of those Christ taught, fed, healed, and carried off, uh, will soon uh, yell, crucify him. And the police of their day, the Roman soldiers, end up beating him, uh, mocking, laughing, spitting, and spearing him. The God uh, chosen secular leader, Pilate, uh, proclaimed Christ innocent with indifference, cond condemns him to death anyway. So, <clears throat> but Judas have, uh, must have been the deepest dagger to the God man. Though it is a part of God's uh, sovereign plan, uh, it is still must have hurt the most. So, wala na sa sakit pa kung ang pagtataksi na yung magagaling sa yung sa yung naman at lubos na natin yung kakatiwalaan. So, so uh, verse 45 seems to indicate Judas was unhesitating. After coming, after coming, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. So the Greek makes an obvious dis uh, distinction between kiss and kiss. In, in verse 44, when Judas says, Whomever I kiss, that's a different form of the word uh, than verse 45 when it says, Rabbi, and kiss him. So the Greek in the verse uh, 44, kiss is from Pileo. It's, it is a sign of affection and, and friendship. But the actual uh, verse uh, 45, kiss is to kiss fervently, to kiss affectionately. And the Greek word for kiss adds a preposition to the front of the word, uh, of the word which intensifies the verb. So when Judas came to Christ, he was actually giving intense expression of affection and, and, and ongoing affection. Uh, it, is, it is the same word uh, used in Luke chapter 15 uh, of the prodigal son <coughs> father who repeatedly kisses the prodigal after he returns from his rebellion. And it is also the same word used in Acts chapter 20 of the Ephesians uh, elders who repeatedly kissed uh, Paul as he departed to Jerusalem. So Judas was putting a, a dramatic show for, uh, of Paul's affection and it, it was designed to make it unmistakable. So Judas was committed to his betrayal. He put on an, an ongoing show of deep affection to the soldiers who would be able to identify Christ without a doubt. So an act of love is performed from, from a mission of hate. Our king made Judas one of his intimate, loyal 12 followers but now, one of the twelve, Judas, finishes his betrayal by turning on Christ with an artificial loyalty, making Judas the greatest villain ever known to man. So, Judas reveals his heart and adds to his rebellions in verse uh, 45. So Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. So, Matthew 26 uh, records this moment as hello or greetings rabbi judas judas identifies jesus as, as rabbi but but not lord at the passover meal when our lord said uh, one of the twelve would betray him they all said surely not i lord uh, all except judas judas might say uh, Ju uh, judas alone might said uh, Sur surely not i rabbi judas is affirming jesus uh, you are my teacher, my rabbi, but Jesus, you are not my Lord, my master. So this, this point uh, gives a clear difference between genuine believers and make believers. There's a clear difference between a real Christian and a fake Christian. Make believers uh, make claims, but don't obey and, and not follow facts. So Matthew 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 22 to 23 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare, declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And even in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what, what I say? In uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. So genuine believers obey and follow Christ as Lord. 
as John uh, chapter 10 verse 37 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And Mark chapter 8 verse 34, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Even James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But prove yourself doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Uh, let's do ourselves. Uh, are we a genuine, a genuine born again believer or, or only a made believer? And verse 45 is the final mention of Judas in the Gospel of Mark. So, what happened to Judas then? Matthew chapter uh, 27 tells us Judah, Judas stayed around after he betrayed Christ until uh, he was condemned. And at that point, Judas felt uh, superficial remorse, tried to give the money back to the uncaring leaders, saying, I have sinned by betraying an innocent blood. The leader responded with, what do we care? And at which point Judas threw the money into the sanctuary and went out and hung himself. And he didn't do that very well. Since Acts chapter 1 uh, tell us, Either the rope broke or the branch broke. His body fell and his mass on rock, resulting in his intestine bursting out. So telling us he died a horrific death. Uh, even Jesus said in verse 21 in Mark chapter 14, it would have been good for that man if he, had, if he had not been born. Judas was a traitor and a hypocrite who betrayed our Lord, his true mentor and his best friend. Judas, the greatest example of wasted opportunity and the deadliest example of brutal betrayal. Uh, but Judas wasn't alone. He is leading a group of men with him. The crowd, which is our second person, a group, a group of people in, in verse uh, 43. So immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with sword and clubs who were who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The crowd uh, with Judas is massive. There is a member of the highest uh, religious group in Israel, the Sanhedrin. Plus, there are at least one representative of the high priest, a large uh, contingent of temple police and, and a cohort of Roman soldiers. Uh, John chapter 18 verse 8 uh, tells us about the, the Roman cohort. A cohort is one tenth of a legion, which is uh, 6,000 men, meaning if they come, if they came in full strength, there would be a 600 uh, Roman soldiers present. So that is not probable because of the late hour, but the uh, religious leaders are not taking any chances. So again, with, with millions of Jesus uh, loving pilgrims in town, many who have heard Christ teach, others who were uh, healed or personally know someone who was healed, or delivered by, by Jesus, thousand who held him of the, uh, as the Messiah on Monday, and the thousand who loved that Christ cleaned out the temple, making a statement against the leaders who, uh, who were financially ripping off uh, worshippers. With so many people like this uh, present, there was a great risk uh, that the crowd might rise, rise up and resist the, uh, the arrest of Jesus. And that's why Judas in verse 43, came up uh, accompanied by a crowd with sword and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So the, the religious leaders made an appeal for troops who carried the short 18-inch uh, sword of the Roman soldiers. And, and they rallied the mafia-led temple councils with their wooden clubs like a police baton. So, and, and to, uh, to accompany the high priests and senatorial representatives all led by Judas to arrest Jesus. So Mark is specific, he says, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So these are the representatives from the uh, religious leaders. So each group has a brief article, making, making them the three distinct uh, group that make up the Sanhedrin, those who want Jesus dead. So total, there, there are at least uh, 200 uh, present to arrest, uh, to arrest Christ. The question this mob was an eerie sight as they uh, made their way up on, uh, 
have the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. So the Gospel of John uh, mentioned torches and lanterns. And it's, a, it's ironic that uh, torches and lanterns <coughs> to search for the life of the world, swords and clubs to subdue the Prince of Peace, and over a hundred men of violence and hate to arrest the Lord of Love. And desperately sinful and twisted men to capture the only holy one. Men of anger and jealousy to seize the man of sorrows. All, all these men for one for a for one man, a man without sin, the God man, the perfect, righteous, blameless, innocent, truthful son of God. So what a gross injustice, uh, what a mockery, and what a shame. And what did uh, they do once they get the hypocritical kiss signal? In verse 46, they laid hands on him and seized him. So as quickly as Judas identified our Lord uh, that night, the soldiers laid hands on him and seized him. Just as Jesus uh, had already told them three times in Mark chapter 8, 9, and, and 10. So it, it says in John chapter 18, verse 12, the Roman court and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So, but the Greek word for this in verse 46 uh, does not describe a modern, day, a modern day process of arresting someone, but actually this designates a, a hostile kidnapping. So they grab Jesus as if he were being kidnapped. They are sudden, harsh, and, and violent. So, yet, uh, do not forget also that our Lord's betrayal and arrest is, is God's sovereign plan. So, clearly port, uh, foretold in Old Testament uh, prophecy and predicted by Lord uh, himself. The violence of this moment uh, begets more violence. And the power Christ will manifest moves one disciple to impulsive action. So, and who is it? Our third person, uh, Peter. In verse 47. So let me read, uh, let's read the 47. Uh, but, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. <coughs> so <coughs> we could not easily guess uh, who this was. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have to. So John reveals this. This is Peter in John chapter, eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 10. So Simon Peter, <coughs> then having a, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and, and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was, was Malchus. So Peter doesn't go uh, after a soldier or, or a temple guard uh, police officer. He, Peter attacks the servant of the high priest. So... <coughs> Uh, kahit mga nabad ba, ba't ako pipili ng kalaban na mas malaki at mas malakas kaysa sa akin? So, Peter picks a fight with the wimpy servant of the high priest. So, why is Peter doing this? Because he got something to prove. So, meron siyang kailangan patunayan. So, he just claimed in Mark chapter 14, verse 29, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And then in verse 31, even if I have to die with you, I will certainly not deny you. And even in Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 23, it says, Lord, with you I am ready to go out both to prison and to death. So so now Peter's uh, got something to prove. But but how does it go? So John chapter 18 des describes it more clearly. So the crowd arrives with Judas. Uh, Judas walks up to the Roman cohorts, uh, including some Roman officers. So the, the temple police with their clubs, the heaviest from the Sanhedrin, and various uh, religious leaders, all, all of whom are carrying swords, clubs, torches, uh, or, or lanterns. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And who, whom do you seek? So they answer and say, Jesus the Nazarene. So next, Jesus speaks the name of God to them, says, I am he. And, and the instant Jesus speaks, I am, they all collapse to the ground. All 200 plus are literally forced 
to the dirt. So the entire crowd went down flat from a supernatural action. So God sovereignly threw them all to the ground, reminding them and us who is truly in control. So <clears throat> that's why Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, I laid down my life. No one has taken it away from me, but I laid it down on my own accord. So, <clears throat> and if you just saw Jesus speak, I am, and somewhere between 200 people are, are laid down, well, would you feel like to, you could pull, your, uh, pull out your sword and do some damage? So after all, uh, Jesus has to do is to speak his name again, and they would all go down again. So that moment infused Peter with impulsive courage. So Luke chapter uh, 22 tell us that the disciples now had a couple of swords in, in preparation for self defense in future ministry. But fortunately for, for Michael, Peter was not a sword man. Peter could, could throw a net, but he was not brain of uh, removing heads. So, when I like to Peter, I was like, I'm going to say, Marcos, I'm going to go to the house, I'm going to go to the house, I'm going to go to So, this is Peter. Uh, Peter boasted too much, prayed too little, and acted too soon. And when we fail to trust God, we are in great danger of praying too little, sleeping too much, and also acting too soon as well. So, Matthew informs us, Jesus says, Stop, enough of this uh, sword play. Matthew 26, verse 52 says, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Then John 18, verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword into the shield. The cup which the Father has given me shall I not drink it. I must die. So, though by implication here, Christ support uh, capital punishment with the statement that those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Uh, Jesus also affirms that kingdom does not, uh, his kingdom does not advance by force. So violence done in the name of Christ is not done in the power of Christ. Or nor by the will of Christ, nor by the glory of Christ. So other religion advances through violence. But Christianity only advances through the gospel, internally transforming one person at a time so violence is not the plan of, of our Lord. In John chapter 18, verse 36 says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of, of this world. If my kingdom were, were of this world, then my servant would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So in Matthew 26, verse 30, uh, 53, our Lord reminds us, Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once put at my, at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. So, in a sense, uh, Jesus uh, says to Peter, after his failed uh, uh, sword slash, seriously, Peter, I could call on 72,000 angels to assist me. Uh, put away your toothpick. So, 12 legions of angels uh, are around 72,000 angels. So, in, 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 sec in Second Kings chapter 19, just one angel slew 185,000 Assyrians <coughs> all by himself. So could you imagine what the 72,000 angels can do? So then in another amazing display of divine power, in front of those who could see uh, Jesus gave Marcos a new gift. So the only healing in the New Testament of oppressed wounds, reminding Peter we don't accomplish God's plan through our fleshly method. We need to do God's work, God's way. God's plan for his son was the cross, which is what Jesus appears in verse 48 and 49. And our fourth person is Jesus himself in verse 48 to 49. It says, And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with sword and clubs to arrest me? As you would against a, a robber. Every day I was with you in the temple, teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to, be, to fulfill the scriptures. <clears throat> so Jesus asked, uh, why soldiers, sword, police, or clubs? Um, 
uh, I was with you in the mix, uh, like in, on Monday, Tuesday, and, and Wednesday. Why now? Why arrest me or seize me now? And and why with such a show of force? So Jesus is unmasking their hypocrisy in, in this concealed operation to take him at night, and which is in violation of all their laws. Do you notice how amazingly calm Christ is here? In a sense, Jesus says, have I, uh, have I ever tried to run from you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, some scary robber or murderous highwayman where you would actually need all these uh, soldiers and police. <coughs> so the Senate didn't have uh, used steel bribery and treachery in order to arrest, arrest Christ, exposing the depth of their uh, wickedness. So what Jesus uh, does um, Jesus says in verse uh, 49, so this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. So the reason why all this happening is because this is the day the scripture will be fulfilled. And in the midst of their mindless anger, they are fulfilling God's perfect sovereign plan exactly on the schedule. Jesus will die exactly at 3 in the afternoon. The same moment thousands of Passover lambs are sacrificed because he is the final sufficient true Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And this is what it's all about. So now we've seen the hypocrit uh, hypocritical betrayer, the hateful crowd, and the impulsive Peter, the majestic Christ, and now the, the cowardly, our fifth person, the, the disciples in verse uh, 50. So, and then they all left him and fled. So all of them fled. They all literally escaped, including Peter. So each one of them deserted Jesus to face the religious anger alone. That's what Jesus said that would, uh, that would do back in verse 27. He told them, you will all fall away. And instead of praying to resist the temptation, they all slept during the crucial prayer opportunity with Christ. So the disciples were, were ill-equipped, afraid, and unfaithful, so they fled. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 predicted this event. It says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That, uh, that prophecy is now fulfilled. So prayerless, inconsistent, and weak, they run for their lives. So there are times with, uh, with danger God expect us to stand our ground. But the disciples fled, and so as our, our sixth person in verse 51 and 52, the, the young man. Verse 51 says, a young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. But he pulled, pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. So this is the first, uh, the very first striker, the first uh, oblation run. So there's way to, uh, too much discussion as to the uh, identity of this young man. So suggestions include, uh, first, uh, a curious, uh, curiosity seeker, a, a, a follower, but, but not one of the twelve. It might be uh, John, the brother of James, or, or James, the brother of Jesus, or Lazarus, or even an angel who are usually described at times as looking like, like a young man. But uh, most believe this is John Mark, the writer of this gospel. Because this interesting event is only listed in Mark's gospel. Some speculate that the upper room was, was actually Mark's house. That Judas and the crowd went there first to find Jesus. This is their young Mark to, to throw on a sheet and follow the, the crowd to get Simon. He was so captivated by what he saw. So he didn't uh, think to play with the disciples and almost got caught. But uh, we don't know. The, the Bible doesn't say so. And what's the point of this then? So it's this. Everyone has deserted Christ, even the one who wrote this gospel. Our Lord is utterly alone with, with his captors. Along Jesus faces his, his faithful leaders. And alone he suffers. Alone he offered his life for ours. And why? So that we who trust in him as Lord and Savior will never be alone. 
So the plight of the young man who is stripped and pleased naked into the dark night is set against our amazing Lord, who is seized, stripped, but refuses to flee, and refuses to preserve himself until the darkness of the crucifixion of our sins has passed. And all this occurs so that Mark uh, chapter 14, verse 27 is entirely for the fulfill. Jesus is deserted by all who would have supported him. So, <clears throat> the good news is, there's one who did not turn away. So, like these guys, uh, we've all turned and run away from God. The Apostle Paul says that there are none who are righteous, no, not one, and that all have turned away. All of us have turned away from God, have prepared to do our own will rather than God's will, and have loved ourselves more than we love God, have lived by our own rules rather than God's rule. So the Bible teaches that there are consequences for running away uh, from God. So because we we run away from God, who made us, God is right and just to judge us. God is holy and must deal with those who have spurned him and mocked his son with empty notion of love and affection. So to those who have not, uh, don't have a personal relationship with, with Christ yet, those who still resist him, just because Jesus graciously and merciful, mercifully allows you to live right now, does not mean you will not face him as, all, as your all-powerful judge. There is only one way to be right with God and go to heaven. And that is through Christ alone. Turn from your sins and depend on Christ. So Jesus is the only one who never turned away from God. He lived to do the will of God. And yet, and yet as the prophet Isaiah said, he was despised and rejected by men. He was arrested and ultimately killed for Christ. He didn't commit for us. Isaiah goes on to say he was born our grips and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. All we like sheep have, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Though we, we've all turned and run away from God, Jesus did not. He did everything God wanted him to do. He surrendered willingly to the will of the Father for our own sake. So the promise of, of this gospel is that everyone who turns away from their sins and put their trust in him will be forgiven of their rebellion and awarded his righteousness. So God used the evil of Judas' uh, betrayal and the cowardice of Jesus' disciples to accomplish his good plan for saving people through the suffering of his son. So may God give us steadfastness like Jesus to joyfully uh, trust and obey Him, even in the most chaotic and painful moments. So let us pray. Uh, Father, thank you for your words, thank you for your gospel, thank you for your love, for we don't deserve any of this. But because of Christ's love, He offers His life willingly, even it causes Him so much pain, even death on the cross, so that we may live according to your sovereign plan. Help us, Lord, equip us to walk the gospel, Read the gospel and share the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.